All right, guys, welcome to the Digital Barbell Podcast. Thanks, as always, for being here. If you are brand new to the show, welcome. Make sure you subscribe before you leave so you don't miss future episodes. If you've ever shared this podcast with somebody else, we appreciate you. If you've ever left us a review, we appreciate you too. Today's topic is the five pillars of improving your body composition. So that's what we're going to get into. Instead of a sponsor this week, we have two shameless plugs real quick. <laughs> Um, we've been putting a lot more effort into our YouTube channel, dropped another kind of like <laughs> behind the scenes <laughs> vlog type episode yesterday. We're not really sure exactly where we're going with this, but we're just testing it out. going to stay consistent for a while and see if you guys like it. It's not really like vlog content. I mean, we're not trying to become vloggers. We're still going to main <laughs> be full-time coaches, but we figure like giving you a little bit of sneak peek behind, you know, how we live, what we consider a healthy lifestyle, what it's like to be an online coach mm -hmm. and just drop some, you know, helpful little knowledge bombs yeah. along the way too. Plus it seems to be pretty popular, um, as far as how much dog content <laughs> is happening in these, in these YouTube episodes. So if you don't already subscribe, it's just youtube.com slash digital barbell check that out. And then if you're listening to this, when it comes out, it's not quite too late to take advantage of the free week of coaching with us. It's just for January, 2024. Mm -hmm. So as long as you slip in under the radar, you are good to go. The people who are partaking in it already are getting a lot out of it. I think uh, getting their minds blown with <laughs> what it's like to be coached by a real coach online. It's just digitalbarbell.com slash free week. Yep. And if we forget to take the link down and you still see it up, you can jump in there too. Exactly. <laughs> okay. With that out of the way, um, we're talking about the five pillars of improving your body composition today. We're going to define what that is and everything, but we were just talking the other day about, you know, we talk a lot about, uh, how people want to look like they lift and they want to see the physical effects of the training and the nutrition mm -hmm. effort that they put in. But really as we coach our clients and as we talk with Haley and stuff, the stuff that we get really fired up about is the improvement in people's quality of life, yeah. hearing about how they have more energy, hearing about how they can play with their kids longer, um, the confidence to do other things in their life, mm -hmm. being able to do hard things. So like, that's the real meat and potatoes of why we're in this. That's what really keeps us going and yeah. makes us pull each other aside and be like, Hey, check out what this person said. How awesome is this? Yeah. But we do realize that, you know, that comes as a result of putting the right emphasis into your training and your nutrition. Mm -hmm. And one of the main drivers of people wanting to get started with that is changing their body composition. Yeah. So that's the reason that we're diving into this specific topic. This is really going to be a deeper dive. We have a lot of notes here, put a lot of thought into this episode. So we're going to go deep on this topic today. Why don't we start with defining what body composition is? Okay. Cause that might be a little bit confusing for people that only think about what their, what their body weight is. Mm -hmm. So body composition is really how we define everything that makes up the structure of our body. It's your muscles, your bone, your water, your skin, mm -hmm. and your body fat. And then in health and fitness, body composition is really thought about in two main categories how much fat you have and how much muscle you have, because those are kind of the things that you see when you look in the mirror. And those are the two things we really have the most control over. So you could be somebody who, um, has weighs a certain number of pounds, but have a different body composition than somebody else that weighs a certain number of uh, same number of pounds. Mm -hmm. And you could look completely different because you have a different body composition. Mm -hmm. So at the, by the same token, you could also weigh the same thing at two different points in your life at two different body compositions and look completely different yeah. too. I can think of a lot of like female clients that may come to us weighing 145 or 150 pounds, thinking that what they want is to get down to 130, mm -hmm. 135 pounds, but they're really after a certain body composition that might happen at 145 pounds yeah. if we do things right. And we're going to get into how we do that right in this episode. So, um, buckle up for that. <laughs> it was funny. I actually, um, my phone, I, I use the Amazon photos and it like brings your memories to you every day. And I like, well, that's the first thing I do in the morning. I like look through what we've been doing throughout the years. And there was a picture of me in 20, either 2020, I think 2020 mm -hmm. in, when we were lived in Idaho doing a ring dip and a picture of me from tw in 2016 in our garage in Houston doing a ring dip. Yeah, it was weird. It was just crazy. like doing a picture. On the same day? Picture, yeah. On, on today, <laughs> those those years, like literally in the bottom position doing a ring dip. The, the one of them had buttons in it, like <laughs> up on me. But anyway, um, I was like, it caught my, I was like, it caught my eye because it was the same movement. And I was like, wow, 
I, I could tell like how much my body composition had changed mm -hmm. in four years. Yeah. And do you think you weighed something similar in those two pictures too? Um, not far, not far apart. Okay. Like I weigh more now, not, not, but, um, maybe within, I don't know, five or six pounds more. And what would you say then like the main difference in your body composition was? Cause maybe somebody heard that and they're like, oh, well you weigh more now. That probably means you have a worse body composition. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, <laughs> I, I felt like I looked very, very, very like frail almost <laughs> like what's the word like i don't for? know what the right word is but like i think back then i thought i looked strong or something i don't know i was just skinny mm -hmm. i didn't really have much muscle right muscle tone on me it was like literally almost like the same kind of outfit to pants and a sports bra uh -huh. <laughs> so it was a good indication of like so uh, basically you have a better body composition now objectively but you weigh but more. a heavier weight so that's yeah. kind of what we're talking about here yeah and the reason that happens is because you know you, people hear, you hear that saying like a pound of fat weighs yeah. a pound of muscle weighs more than a pound of fat. Well, no, they both weigh a pound, <laughs> but, weigh. but the thing is body fat takes up more room on your body for the same weight than uh -huh. muscle does. Like, you know, if, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, let's say a, a pound of fat is like the size of my fist while well, pound of, I'm sorry, a pound of muscle is like the size of my fist. Mm -hmm. Well, a pound of fat might be three sizes of fists. So if you lose three pounds of fat, you're going to look different than if you uh, lose three pounds of muscle or you gain three pounds of fat, you're going to look different than if you gain three pounds of mm -hmm. muscle because they take up different volumes on your body and they're going to be stored in different places too. If you gain a bunch of muscle, you're not going to gain it on your tummy. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to gain it in your arms and legs. So let's talk about kind of the four different kinds of body composition that you might see walking around. Okay. Okay. Picture a strong man. Who's, who are some popular like strong a strong men? man is like the guys that can like pick up the Atlas stones and like yeah. hoist them over and they, the Atlas stone itself weighs like 500 pounds. The, the mountain. That's who I was trying yeah, to think of. Yeah. The mountain or yeah. Okay. So, well, yeah, he's, he's an exception. I've, lately he's an exception. He's an exception. <laughs> okay. But a strong man basically is somebody who has an above average amount of body fat, but they also have mm -hmm. a, an above average amount of muscle on yeah. them. They're just a really big, strong human. Okay. Mm -hmm. So picture that body type. Yeah. And then a different body composition is somebody who's just overweight. I mean, this is just like the average American that you see walking around. This person has an above average amount of fat and a below average amount of mm -hmm. muscle. That just is what the overweight type body composition yeah. is. And then we have the skinny fat body composition. This is somebody who has an average amount of fat, but has a below average amount of muscle. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of person that they look kind of average with their shirt on mm -hmm. and then they go to the beach and it's just kind of like a soft flabby look because they've got average fat, but they got no muscle. Right. Okay. Then we have an athletic body composition. This is kind of categorized by having below average amount of fat and above average amount of muscle. Mm -hmm. So this situation is worse. You can actually see how much muscle somebody has because mm -hmm. they've got an above average amount and they don't have a lot of body fat obscuring the, the definition of right. the muscle. And then we got the body composition of a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah. These are people, people who have extremely low, usually temporarily low levels of body fat and extremely high levels of muscle on them. Yeah. You can see every striation of the muscle because there's tons of it. Right. And there's zero fat, zero fat obscuring the definition of the muscle. So those are, those are kind of like okay. visualizations. Yeah. So you said four, but that was five. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> My notes say four and that was five. Maybe we, oh, you know, we threw bodybuilders in at the last second. Yeah. Cause I think that's one level above like an athletic look like. Right. Right. And I think that most people who come to us are striving for somewhere in that athletic, athletic yeah. range. Nobody comes to us hiring like, Hey, I want to be skinny fat. How can we make that happen? <laughs> So since we said that, bo that body composition in real life is really the ratio of body fat to muscle, improving your body composition comes down to manipulating those two variables. Mm -hmm. Now, how are we going to know when this is happening? If we're, yeah. if we're trying to get away from using our body weight as a metric, well, there's different you know, things you can pay to go have done. You can get a DEXA scan, you can do a bod pod, all those kinds of things. But me personally, probably mm -hmm. you personally, and most people listening to this, the result they want isn't a number on a bod right. pod printout. It's, it's what a, they see in the mirror, or how, how they feel fit. in their yeah. clothes. 
the emotions that they have, like regarding their self-confidence when they see the reflection of themselves in the mirror. So I think that really is the best way to yeah. measure what's going on with your body mm -hmm. composition. If we want to have something objective to do, probably the, the closest thing we can use is just a waist measurement because whether you're male or female, a lot of us tend to store mm -hmm. excess fat that is obscuring our body composition on our midsection. So getting a waist circumference about an inch above your belly button is going to be an objective measure of if you're improving your body composition mm -hmm. or not, in addition to what you're seeing in the mirror. It is pretty amazing how far these scales that give you these metrics have come. Like, I mean, back, back just yeah. a few years ago, we, we would go and, you know, you would have to go do something like a bod pot or whatever you float in water and they, oh, yeah. and they give you literally the same thing that you can get daily now by standing on a scale that, that has the little four trigger points. I mean, right. it's, it's pretty amazing how far this I mean, technology the, has come. I know that stuff is not, the scale is not accurate, a hundred percent accurate, <laughs> but neither was the bod pod, but yeah. it give, at least it gives you a, like, here's where I'm starting. And then it gives you the changes. You got to be careful with those scales too, though, because they count water weight as um, non-fat mass. So mm. any, any water retention that you have is counted as muscle on those things too. But over the long term, if you're doing it like you average your body weight out and you just look yeah. at the average of how your the, uh, the metrics on that scale that you stand on are changing, it can kind of tell you if you're headed in the right direction. Yeah. But again, we're going for a result in the mirror too. Mm -hmm. So don't get too hung up yeah. on what those kinds of metrics are doing. All right. We have like I said, these five pillars of improving your body composition. So let's dig into the one, let's, let's dig into one that isn't included in the five because it's nothing that you have control over. We're only okay. going to focus on the things you have control over today. That's your genetics. Some we people, we're not going to talk about genetics, right? It's not one of the five, but it is a factor in your body composition. We're not going to focus on it because you can't change it. And there's, I mean, you can't change your genetics, mm -hmm. but you can probably outwork your yeah. genetics. I just want to like throw that out there as if you feel like you were, you know, dealt a, a bad hand as far as your genetics and you're never going to be able to improve your body composition, get that out of your mind. We've helped dozens of people who have felt that way mm -hmm. achieve great results. I don't feel like I have elite genetics. I don't feel like I have an elite body composition either, but I have been able to drastically change my body mm -hmm. composition over the last 15 years through doing the things that we're going to talk about mm -hmm. in this episode. So you can overcome <laughs> genetics. What are you laughing at? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can only assume it's because you think my body composition is so good and just makes you want to laugh. <laughs> All right. What's pillar number one? And then right. I'll dig into it. I need to take a, give my voice a little bit of a break. Eating the right amount of food. And in this case, we're talking about the right amount of calories, not the volume yeah. of food. So... Whether you're trying to gain muscle, lose fat, whatever, the key thing that you cannot ignore is the total calories that you're mm -hmm. eating. That is going to be the thing that drives a ton of your body composition progress. Basically, what we're talking about here is energy balance. If your body composition is suffering because you have more than average amount of body fat, we have to get you down into a calorie deficit to lose some of that fat. Mm -hmm. If you are under muscled and you're, you consider yourself a hard gainer or you are skinny fat, we've got to increase the number of calories that you eat, get you into, into a calorie surplus. So you have the extra energy to be able to build that new tissue that is going to actually improve the body composition. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that confuses people about the amount of food that you eat is if you've never tracked your calories and seen how many calories are in certain kinds of food, you might feel like you're eating a lot and you're not really because you're eating a lot of lower calorie foods, or you might feel like you're only eating a little, but you're not, but you're actually eating a lot of calories because you're choosing foods that only give you a tiny portion for a ton of calories. Of calories. Yeah. So having some awareness and we're not telling you you have to go track your calories, but it just it can kind of eliminate some of the confusion about why you think it might not mm -hmm. be working to increase the amount of awareness of how many calories right. you're eating. So if you want to do that, you're serious about, you know, dialing in the food quantity, AKA calories that you're eating. The easiest thing you can do is to simply track how much you're eating for one to two weeks, you know, being really accurate with it because yeah. we're just doing this for a temporary amount of time and then adjusting how much you eat from there. 
like based I said, on what happens, based on how much yeah. you're already eating and what your goal yeah. is. So to get a baseline, let's say like I'm eating an average of 3000 calories per day and I am to start improving my body composition. I know I need to lose some fat. I need to create a calorie mm -hmm. deficit of about 15% and stick with that. If I'm under muscled and I'm trying to gain, I find out I'm only eating 1800 calories per day. I need to add about five to 10% to that. Do it religiously for a few weeks and see if progress starts heading mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, if you think that you've dialed in those things and it's not working, meaning you're not seeing improvements in any of the metrics you're tracking, including looking in the scale after two to three weeks, then we can start to make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Don't make an adjustment if you don't feel like you're being consistent, yeah. but make a small adjustment and then give it more time to settle in and see if it's working. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how far to go down the rabbit hole of, cause I, I don't, I'm not trying to um, encourage people that they have to track yeah. their calories with it, but a five to 10% increase or decrease in total calories is enough to start with to see if it'll make the needle move. And if you're somebody who is willing to kind of build out a template of meals and stick with that, and you don't have to actually track your calories, you can just, you know, slightly increase the portions that you're eating mm -hmm. or slightly decrease the portions that you're eating. And that will, you know, ensure that you're either decreasing or increasing calories. Okay. Um, if you are kind of like the, the skinny fat person and you, you're used to eating about the same amount of calories, you probably don't have to go into a drastic surplus to gain weight. If you do everything else that we're going to talk about in this, um, episode, you can probably con continue to eat about the same number of calories that you have been mm -hmm. and focus on the next thing we're going to talk about and, and start to see body composition changes without, um, having to increase how much you're eating. Yeah. Basically we're talking about continuing to eat your maintenance calories by, and then increasing your protein intake, doing the training that we're going to talk about, and you're going to see body composition changes pretty quickly. Okay. Introduce number two so I can take a <laughs> sip of my water. These, um, these episodes where I talk a lot, they wear me out, man. Well, I was just going to say one thing about, like you were talking about, you don't want to have to say, like, you have to track your food in order to do this. But I always say that, like, at least getting an idea of, of how much you're putting on your plate is a good idea by using a scale, just knowing how much protein you're putting on there. Like if you're getting servings of rice and in the past, like that's really easy ways to manipulate. That's how I've done it. Like if I want to add or remove calories, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to take one and a half servings of rice, or I'm going to take three quarter servings of rice. And I manipulate these things that don't make a huge impact on my overall diet of my day. Yeah. I'm like, I can take a little bit less or a little bit more oatmeal and rice and, and these things like that. And I don't feel like I'm, Oh, I have to remove yeah. a snack or I have to remove like half of my meal and or, I'm going to, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be hungry. Like that's not, that's a really that's easy a way to like way, yeah. adjust. But like he said, like you really do have to give these things time. Like it, it, it it's not it, like we, <laughs> we sometimes wish it was like, what did I eat yesterday? Because this yeah. is how I feel. It's not, there's not an immediate change. For sure. And I think that that's one thing. I think we are all, we, we're all, I think our friend Chris is one of the first people that told me that. And I was like, what? Like a long time ago? Cause he was like, I've been consistent what with you my do, like, what day. you do like this week affects you next week. And I was like, well, you're crazy. It's like, if I eat a piece of cake right now, that's going to affect me tomorrow, not down the road, you know, yeah. or whatever. And like, I would even say after working with a lot of people, it really is spread out more to like two weeks and beyond. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people, you know, went pretty hard between Christmas and new year's. And then on January one, they were like, Wait, in. <laughs> well, they, they were like, like oh, I'm, yeah, like, I, I only gained a pound over the holidays yeah. and they went back to eating their normal. And then all those excess calories caught up with them. And all of a sudden now they're up three, four pounds mm -hmm. and they're thinking like, well, what the heck? I've been perfect the last week. Well, it takes a while for your body to, to deal with all the extra calories. Yeah. And it's like the, both, both of the calorie side and the activity side, like maybe calories were high activity was low and it's taken a while to get settled back into your normal, what you normally were eating and what your normal activity levels right. were. Yeah, it, that's, a, you know. that's a great point. Okay. Uh, and I'll just throw this out there too. You know, if you're listening to this and you're like, I know, you know, I need to lose body fat to improve my body composition. Boom. Calorie deficit is the answer for you. If you know you are like way underweight 
and you need to gain muscle, boom, mm -hmm. you know calorie surplus is right for you. If you feel like you're kind of in that gray area, just reach out to us. We're not going to give you a sales pitch, but we'll talk to you and help you decide, you know, which direction you need yeah. to go. Or if you're that person that can probably eat at maintenance calories, focus on everything else that we talked about and mm -hmm. start to see the changes that you want. So you can reach out, just send us a message on Instagram and we'll help you out. Speaking of everything else, second pillar is macronutrient partitioning. This is how you spread your calories out throughout the day. All right. So all calories count, but not all calories count the same, meaning that they each have a different role in your body and they're dealt with differently in your body also. So okay. let's all calories can be broken down into protein, carbs, or fat. Alcohol is a fourth macronutrient, not particularly useful for improving your body composition. So we're not even going to touch on that uh, because it's, it just doesn't yeah. help. It ain't going to help you improve your body composition. <laughs> <laughs> we don't give our, uh, our clients that come to uh, us for body composition change a prescription of how much alcohol <laughs> to drink <laughs> to get said desired result. Okay. So looking at the other three categories of macros, protein, carbs, and fat protein is the one that has the most power to help you change your body composition. If all you did was go from under eating protein to eating enough protein and you gave it the time mm -hmm. you would start to see the changes that you want. And then the second thing that's missing for most people is eating enough, what I like to call high performance carbs. These are the carbs that are really good at fueling your training. And then we also find that people are typically overeating. They're eating more body fat than is beneficial or needed to improve their Wait, body composition. Not, not eating body fat. Is that what I said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fat. Oh, that's funny. The macronutrient fat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. could find somebody who's interested in eating body fat, <laughs> um, yeah. So most people are way over eating diet, more dietary fat than is necessary or beneficial for improving your mm -hmm. body composition. Instead of going really deep into that, just listen to episode 302 of the podcast where we laid out uh, our opinion on why a low fat diet is superior for results. But for some quick notes, we can set, just say that like, you said for most people, protein and high performance carbs are missing. We know how to add protein in. Right. Um, high performance carbs. Think about carbohydrates that are not processed. Like think about all your fruits, all your vegetables, all your grains. These are the high performance carbs. It's, Nothing that comes in a box. Something that does not have an expiration date. Something that right. expires naturally. <laughs> I mean, and these these like beneficial carbs get thrown out the window when somebody thinks that they're ready to like get in shape, lose weight, yeah. all that kind of stuff because they're carbs. So they get thrown out just because they fall into that category. The rice but, and the oats and the apples and the bananas don't need to be thrown out. The right. cereal boxes and the cookie boxes and anything that comes in boxes needs to be thrown out. Right. Those are the things that are not going to help you improve right. your body composition because they are really just carbs bound with fats that are making you overeat food, making you overeat calories, mm -hmm. zapping you of energy, putting you on a roller coaster of energy up and down throughout the day. Get all, get, we'll talk about how many carbs to eat, but if you can focus on high performance carbs, you're going to give your body the fuel that it needs to make the changes that you want. Okay. You know, the average, let's go back to protein for a second. Um, the average guy that comes to us that for body composition change, we find that they're usually eating somewhere around a hundred grams of protein per day. And we're talking about guys that could range anywhere from 150 to 200 mm -hmm. pounds. The average woman that comes to us is probably eating somewhere around 75 grams of protein per day. These are far less than are optimal for improving your body composition. Do they meet the RDA um, minimums for protein? Yeah. Look at the back of any nutrition label and you'll see it's pitifully low. How many grams of protein will keep you from being deficient in protein, mm -hmm. but we're not talking about being deficient. We're talking about giving your body the energy, the, the building blocks of muscle that it needs to build the tissue that is going to improve your body composition. You need to go to digitalbarbell.com or just the show notes for this episode and download our macronutrient calculator mm -hmm. to find out how many grams of protein we recommend for you based on your goal. Um, to find that you can just, if you, if you, if you haven't been to the website before, it will pop up as soon as you get there. If you have been to the website, if you go to, um, the free content section, there will be all like the down, the downloads or there's a page for all the downloads. Right. Um, it's just a digitalbarbell.com slash free. Yeah what she said just as a range though, most mm -hmm. men are going to fall in the 150 to 200 grams per day range. And most women are going to fall in the 125 to 150 grams. Again, this is to optimize your body composition. Yeah. 
Okay, let's go back to carbs for a second. How okay. many carbs should you eat to optimize your body composition? As many as humanly possible. <laughs> carbs are literally the fuel source for the training that you have to do mm -hmm. to build the muscle that you need to be able to improve your body composition. So we want to have plenty of that on, on hand. Plus, if you look at the strategy that bodybuilders use to... It's funny how much you can learn from bodybuilders because they're basically robots when it comes like to, yeah. you know, using nutrition to drive results. So, you know, bodybuilders cut their calories down super, super low to get super, super lean. And then a week or so before their competition, they fuel up on carbs to fill their muscles with stored carbs called glycogen. Mm -hmm. And it gives them that full look that they need on stage to flex and do all the things. So we can think about that and know that eating a fair amount of carbs is going to mm -hmm. keep our muscles full of glycogen fueling the training that we need, but also giving them the size that is going to improve your body composition too. You don't want to walk around with deflated muscles if you're trying to look more athletic and jacked. Uh, okay. So I said, you want to eat as many carbs as possible. Mm -hmm. Think about it this way. Once you kind of know the total quantity of food that you need to eat, and you now know the total amount of protein that you need to eat per day, we want to eat a minimal amount of fat which is somewhere in the 40 to 60 grams for dudes and a little bit less than that for women. Again, you can use the calorie calculator on our website to find out how much we recommend for you. And then we're going to fill in all the rest of our calories with carbs. Mm -hmm. Remember there's four calories per gram of carbs. So the goal is always to eat as much of that as possible while staying within the total quantity of food mm -hmm. we need total. So again, protein remains a constant fat is at a minimum and we fill in the rest with carbs to drive our, our body composition and performance in the gym. And remember, last but not least, carbs do not cause weight gain. <laughs> Total calories drives your body weight, not carbs. You do not need to eliminate carbs to improve your body composition. <laughs> Am I clear? <laughs> All right. Oh man. Third pillar, build strength. Yes. Simple. That's it. Next S one. No, <laughs> Strength is the base of your physique. And this is the reason, well, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen somebody who has a really good body composition and just thought to yourself, man, oh boy, that person is weak. <laughs> they look super weak. No, every person you see who looks athletic also looks strong. And the reason is because they built strength. People skip over this part when they think about getting in shape, getting toned, getting fit, getting whatever. Mm -hmm. And they immediately go to the burning. I got to burn more. I got to, you know, join this boot camp that burns a ton of calories. I got to take this spin class that burns a ton of calories. I got to mm -hmm. do these, uh, muscle building or muscle burning exercises <laughs> that I got to go join a gym that where you feel like you have to lay on the floor after every single workout, they go to the burning, mm -hmm. but the base of your physique is by building strength. So that is where we need to focus because we need to build the tissue, the muscle that gives the body the shape that we're then going to reveal by losing the fat mm -hmm. that's covering it. You can't lose the fat that's covering your bones and expect to look good at the end of the day. You got <laughs> to build bones. something underneath there. You know what I mean? Yeah. You hear what I'm cooking? Mm -hmm. You smell what I'm cooking? <laughs> you hear what I'm cooking? <laughs> okay. So forget the hit for a second. Forget the toning exercises. Forget the burning. Let's build some strength. How are we going to do that? We are going to focus on the fundamentals of strength, the heavy compound lifts, the squats, the rows, the deadlifts, the presses, and we're going to work with weights that challenge us to where we can only do a set of like four to six reps before we hit failure. And then we're going to monitor that intensity. We're going to make sure that we're adding weight over time. We're going to use progressive overload. We're going to rest between sets so we can put in a solid effort. We're not going to do jumping jacks and high knees and jumping lunges between sets of squats to keep the metabolic fuel burning. <laughs> we are going to get stronger. You know how you can get stronger? Mm -hmm. You can go to digitalbarbell.com oh. slash free week and let us show you real quick. Okay. I get fired up about that because I want you to get stronger. When I look at the biggest changes in my own body composition, it was during the time that I mm -hmm. dedicated to getting stronger. And I know the same can be true for you. And you kind of gave our secret away in this first list that you gave. I think like when people think about like the fundamentals of building strength, maybe they might think of the squats, the presses and the deadlifts and the bench presses. You, you, the second thing you mentioned was rows. And I think that that's so many people that come 
to work yeah. with us. Haven't been doing any type of of rowing. Not, I'm not talking about a rowing on a yeah. rowing machine, but I'm talking about like barbell row, rows, dumbbell barbell rows, row. yeah, any kind like, of pulling, and and, and, heavy and pulling. like people like look at somebody they look from the back and they're like, oh, like they look strong. Look at their back or whatever, and like they're if they're not they they're doing some sort of rowing yeah. a lot in their programming and yeah yeah I've definitely made an Instagram post somewhere in the last five years. This is the thing you're not doing <laughs> that, <laughs> like, that. And just like you look at somebody from behind, you can tell yeah. if they're strong, you know, mm -hmm. forget it. You could just walk up behind and be like, that's a strong person. Mm -hmm. I want to be that person. <laughs> I love doing uh, rows for just for overall strength. It, mm -hmm. it translates to so much. And you're yeah. like, you said, so many people aren't doing it. So we know if we're like d doing the strength work, doing these compound lifts, that's the cake. What about the icing? We need any good cake has icing that right. once we have the cake built, this, the cake of strength. Now we're going to add the icing on of doing the accessory work, doing the conditioning, doing the conditioning. All, all those mm -hmm. things are part of forming a good body composition, mm -hmm. but most people skip right to that, the icing right. without building the cake and it ain't going to work. Or they want just, I'm going to just build the muscle. I'm just going to work on the strength. And then they've worked on the strength and they've built the muscle and they're like, yeah, I don't really want to do that conditioning piece. <laughs> Blakely will always be the one to tell you, do your conditioning. You have to do your conditioning. <laughs> yes, you do. I mean, going back to the bodybuilders, you think mm -hmm. those guys aren't doing a lot of conditioning? Please, man, please. <laughs> okay. We beat that one All up. Right. We built the Fourth cake. pillar, recovery. Think about a plant. What is a plant? Oh, boy. What does a plant need to survive? It needs the sun. It needs water. Is that all it needs? It needs some <laughs> oxygen too. But the point is, you can't just water a plant and keep and it in the it. dark mm -hmm. and expect it to grow. You can't just set it out in the sun and never water it and expect it to grow. Expect it to grow. It takes the relationship of these two things mm -hmm. to make the plant grow. So all the stuff with the nutrition that you do, all the stuff that you do with your workouts, that's one side of it. And then the other side that makes it all work is the recovery the time that you're not in the gym, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. That is actually when you improve it. I know we've beat this topic up on this podcast, but the way this whole thing works is this cycle. Mm -hmm. Stress, that is the workouts that you do. Recovery, that is what you do outside of the gym. Adaptation, that is what happens because of the first thing, first two things that you did. And that cycle repeats, and that's what makes you better. So if you're only focusing on the stress and you're not doing the recovery, mm -hmm. you're not gonna get the adaptation. If all you're doing is recovering, <laughs> never putting in enough stress, you're not going to get right. a good adaptation either. It takes the relationship of both of them. So there's a few things that are included in this word recovery that you're talking about. We should probably talk about that. You know, you know what it's not? What? Ice baths, sauna, all right. red light therapy. But you know what it is. Cupping. Recovery is your nutrition. Recovery is your sleep. Recovery is like your rest. Rest days. Rest days and recovery is stress management. That's right. Those are the real mm -hmm. things of recovery yeah. that make a difference. I was joking about all the other stuff. If that stuff makes you feel better, mm -hmm. helps you, you know, unwind, de-stress, those kinds of things, and you have time and money for it, go for it. But they're not the main drivers of your body composition when it comes to the factors of recovery. It's kind of like the nutrition. Like it's like the pyramid. It's like like the main pillars are going to be like, how much are you sleeping? How much are you managing your stress? How much, you, how many, you know, are you, what days are you recovering? Right. How much you're eating? All that stuff. And then adding on like, yeah. I want to do ice baths. I want to do saunas. I want to, that's like the, the, the top of the pillar. Like if you're sacrificing, people who are like elite athletes are doing these things. Right. That's the t top of the pyramid. Exactly. Like if you're, you know, spending a hundred dollars a month on cupping, but you're not sleeping eight hours a night, mm -hmm. you're, doing, right. you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Um, okay. Right. Let's talk about, you know, we have the two sides of a body composition. We have the fat loss side and we have the muscle building side. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how, how these factors of recovery play into those things. Okay. Sleeping less than about seven hours per night decreases insulin sensitivity, which leads to chronically elevated levels of insulin and fat storage proven. Okay. That's a fact. Not sleeping enough increases mm -hmm. the stress hormone cortisol, which if left unchecked and elevated increases muscle breakdown. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing for body composition. Not sleeping enough decreases testosterone, human growth hormone, and the sex hormones that control muscle building. Not beneficial for improving your body composition. Not sleeping enough decreases muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. Just by the, even if you don't know what that means, you can probably surmise that you want that if you're trying to grow muscle. <laughs> Um, 
we can learn a lot from the professional athletes on the recovery side too. Not just the ones who have time for the red light therapy and the cupping, but just they prioritize their sleep. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I remember the series of the HBO show Hard Knocks where they follow around like the last place mm -hmm. football team in the episode of the series they did about the Houston Texans. They were following JJ Watt around and he knew how important sleep was to his recovery and he would slip away like in between sessions and he had set up this little closet somewhere around the training yeah. campgrounds that was all there. blacked out <laughs> and he would go in there and, and sleep. Uh, Michael Phelps, he was sleeping like 10 hours a night but in training leading up for the Olympics. For a person, regular life person, that's probably not something that it, we can do. We can't that, go take naps in a hidden closet. We can't sleep 10 hours. Speak for yourself. <laughs> but you haven't found my hidden I do sleep think closet. that sleep is one of those things where we're just like, oh, I can't sleep or I like, I'm, it's like, we're not going to go into how to sleep better, but there are ways to, to fix your sleep. There are things that you can do. Just like if a child isn't sleeping, we really want that child to sleep. We're going to do some things to help that child sleep. So, you know, same thing. <laughs> there gonna... are, there are things that you can do to improve your sleep and just leave it at that. And thinking it's, it's, it's such an important factor that you just have to, that's a really to, funny point. You just to made. work on it. Like it's something that I think a lot of people just say, like throw it in the air. Like I can't sleep good in yeah. that. And they don't do work to fix it. Right. Anyway, let's. <laughs> well, you just made me that. That's real. I need to like think about this a little what? bit. Maybe write an email about it. How we would know not to send our child to bed with. We don't have a child, but you can't send a child to bed with a tablet. Leave all the lights on. You know, like, give them sleep. some caffeine and like expect them to sleep well. No, you set up their environment so that our niece sometimes tries to fool me into doing that. that she, <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost done watching the show, one more and then I'll go to sleep. And I'm yeah. like, so why do we do that to ourselves yeah. if it doesn't work? Good point. Um, okay. So that's how lack of sleep affects, uh, fat loss, uh, muscle building. Let's mm -hmm. talk about how it affects fat loss. I already said that not sleeping enough decreases insulin sensitivity. That's a bad thing for nutrient partitioning and all that good stuff. It also really jacks with the hormones that control your hunger and satiety. The hormone leptin that suppresses your appetite is decreased when mm -hmm. you don't sleep enough. The hunger ghrelin that increases your appetite is ramped up when you don't sleep. You ever had a bad night's sleep and been like, man, I am hungry today. <laughs> They've done studies on this. People who are deprived of, I think it's, it was six or less hours in the study, ate an average of 300 to 500 calories per day more from being sleep deprived. Also, it just lowers your inhibitions, makes your cravings increase, mm -hmm. predisposes you to making poor nutrition choices. You're going to crave highly palatable processed foods. All of those things are working against improving your body composition, both on the muscle building and the fat loss side of the equation. Womp womp. So let's talk real quick about uh, how, you know, stress, mm -hmm. it, it stress drives sleep too. Yeah. I mean, oh, any, any, sure. anytime I can't sleep at night, it's because I'm stressed about something mm -hmm. and I'm waking up thinking about it. So, you know, this isn't an episode about stress management, but I think the thing people forget about with stress management is instead of just trying to manage the stress, what can we do to eliminate the thing in your life that's stressing you? Mm -hmm. Is it something that we need to learn to let go of? Is it something in our environment that we can change or an unhealthy relationship? You know, something we're doing on our phone that's stressing us out. Let's try to like nip it in the bud yeah. instead of just trying to come up with coping mechanisms for the stress. That way we're, you know, solving the problem at its root. Mm -hmm. Rest days. All right. You like take rest days? Yeah. You do? Mm -hmm. Today's a rest day. Today's a rest day for us. We recommend taking at least two full-fledged rest days per week. That doesn't mean you just lay there comatose, go for a walk, whatever, mm -hmm. do something that you enjoy that helps you with your stress management. Mm -hmm. But giving your body two full days of rest per week is enough to deal with the accumulated fatigue you have from training and give your body a chance to catch up from the stress in the gym that you've applied mm -hmm. throughout the week too. Remember, it's about the stress recovery adaptation cycle. You're not going to get better results with your body composition by training seven days per week. It might feel tempting to try to put all the emphasis yeah. on that, but the rest is just as important. And I know that people can struggle with this, that, yeah. you know, they can feel like, man, I need to be doing more. Or like, you know, if, if exercise is part of your stress management, um, routine, you know, find a way to, to do that on your rest days in a way that isn't causing your body 
extra fatigue that you have to recover. Yeah, it can be getting on like a bike, like an airdyne bike or something like that, and you know, nothing intense, nothing nothing intense, intense, yeah, just movement. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, Um, and then of course the big, the big boy on the recovery side is your nutrition. Mm -hmm. You know, like Blakely said, it, it follows a hierarchy. The total quantity of food that you eat is the most important. The next is the total protein that you eat, then focusing on whole foods, making sure you're getting enough fiber, making sure you're eating a vast array of fruits and vegetables Mm -hmm. for micronutrients, and of course, staying hydrated. Somewhere in that half of an ounce per, half of an ounce of water per pound that you weigh Mm -hmm. is a good neighborhood to live in to make sure you're adequately hydrated. Drinking to thirst is another way to do it. (laughs) You don't necessarily have to add an electrolyte powder into your drink, just drink enough water and you're good to go. Okay, you have to talk because my voice is getting tired All right. again. Are we moving on? Do you have Last anything else pillar? you want to say on recovery? I don't think so. Okay. I just want to make sure that wasn't that was that was clear. I guess. Um, so we were talking about recovery has various factors, and that's sleep, stress management, rest days from workouts, and your nutrition. That's right. All right. Last one: periodization and patience. Periodization is just a fancy way to say that you're probably not going to like hit your ideal body composition in one fell swoop, meaning you start at, you know, 30 pounds overweight and end up jacked and tan Mm -hmm. all in one run. It's okay to, to kind of look at reaching your ultimate goal in stages and periodizing your life with that in Mm -hmm. mind. Check out um, episode 209 of the podcast where we gave a one-year plan to optimize your body composition. Uh, you know, most people that, you know, the people that we coach, we try to help understand realistic expectations of the timeline for how long it takes to get results. Mm-hmm. And then how to like make this work within the context of being a regular human in the regular context of the calendar mm-hmm. also. And that's what periodizing really looks like. Maybe November through January isn't the time where we should be the most dialed in and focused on improving our body composition. Maybe we plan things out. So that's a time of year where we're focused on building Mm -hmm. strength at more of a maintenance calorie or slight surplus range. Mm -hmm. That's what periodizing looks out. Looks like you're not going to get tan in those months either. Yeah. You're going to be pale. (laughs) You might as well not worry about being jacked either. Um, but yeah. And then, you know, when people start out, improving their body composition, it is a pretty linear, um, phase that you go through there, you, There's this period of new beginnings where mm-hmm. everything's just working. You're losing fat, building muscle simultaneously, but eventually that runs out. And then people who really end up changing their body composition go through phases where they're, you know, dedicated, focused on building mm-hmm. strength, dedicated, focused on losing fat. You've probably heard this described as going through like bulking Bulk, and yeah. cutting phases. That's all that it is. And it's a proven cycle that Mm -hmm. we've run many clients through that we've used personally. And it it just works. It's periodizing your goals around your life too, so that you enjoy the process instead of it just feeling like this never ending slog along the way. And that's where periodization helps because in in thinking through the seasons of the year, seasons of your life, yes, because it can just kind of occur naturally, like during maybe the holiday, you know, from October through January, there's more of a surplus of calories around. That's when we can go through that bulking phase. And then we want to pull back to go through that cutting phase. I think that's one of the big benefits of, you know, working with a coach or having a relationship with a coach. If you're trying to do this also is like, if you were just to, you know, read a book on, body recomp or, you know, download a program on body comp, it's going to tell you like, all right, here's your calories. Here's your nutrition plan to lose Mm -hmm. weight. But it's not going to tell you like, what do I do if um, I lose my job and you know, I'm stressed. Yeah. How do I handle that situation? Or I got a bum shoulder. Mm -hmm. What do I do then? Like, do I need to adjust my training or nutrition for that? Should I still be focused on fat loss during that phase? Like I'm getting a divorce, whatever it is. Like, having a coach to be like, help me work through this, help me periodize my goal around my actual life. That's the benefit of having Mm -hmm. a coach. I don't know why it just made me think of like my grandpa and who like kind of lived out in the country, like on a, like a farm ish Mm -hmm. kind of place. And like, I feel like his body composition changed with the seasons, but totally naturally (laughs) the man never worked out that I know of. I mean, a day in his life. Just on the farm. <laughs> oh, well, that's, well, well, well we did. Yeah. He, he, anyway. After, yeah. Um, but that's a funny story. Uh, 
I was just thinking about like, you know, in the winter, he probably was more idle, less tan, a little bit heavier yep. in the summer. He was working more. He was moving more. He was lifting more things like yeah. around the house. I mean, around the farm, he was tanner, yeah. you know, it was just like, it's, it's a true, it's a true natural progression for, for, for people uh -huh. as they go through the seasons true. of life. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's, oh. Let's get some specifics here, though. Like, okay, because I want. Uh, let's. Well, we said periodization and patience. Let's skip yeah, over let, to the patience. Yeah, that's what I was about part. to say. Patience is really just about having the right expectations mm -hmm. for how long is this going to take. And of course, in this medium, we can't tell you how long it's going to take because we don't know where you're starting from. Right. But we can help you establish some realistic expectations of progress. If you're the person who's improving their body composition by losing fat, losing a half a pound or a pound per week on average is amazing. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're, whatever you're doing is giving you that kind of results and the, and the weight loss is being reflected in the mirror, the way that you want to see it, because you're doing all the things we talked mm -hmm. about in this episode, keep doing it. You're killing it. And if there's ever a week or two where you don't, for whatever reason, lose that half pound or a pound, it's okay. Yeah. That, that is perfectly normal. That is part of the process. You're not supposed to lose weight every single week, even if you're doing everything correctly. And that if you're somebody who's trying to gain weight, you're that under muscled person, you're training hard, you're eating your protein, try to gain about a quarter pound per week mm -hmm. or a pound per month on average. If you start to, um, look in the mirror and you're like, I'm gaining too fast because you're not, you know, you're not liking the results yeah. that you see. Okay. Dial back a little mm -hmm. bit. And if there's a week where you don't gain, or there's a month that you don't gain much, it's okay too. That doesn't mean that it's not working. Monitor the mirror. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to, I was looking at my notes and I already mm -hmm. kind of said that, but you know, a lot of this is about embracing the process, kind yeah. of letting go of the expectation you have of whatever you're going to feel like when you reach the goal body that you're, you're chasing and just enjoying the process of fueling your body appropriately. Like we talked about at the top of this podcast, recognizing the progress that you're making in the way that you feel the energy you have the things that you're able to do, mm -hmm. like living without as many restrictions in your life and, and enjoying the training and the way that you're getting to fuel your body. Imagine like you are going to drive from Washington state all the way down to LA. You're going to drive down the coast. You need to get to LA for this meeting that you have, and you're going to take the Pacific coast highway the whole way. I don't even know if the Pacific coast highway goes from Washington to LA, but stick with me for this example. <laughs> You're so focused oh, on Lord. getting there that you just are laser focused and you miss the entire mm -hmm. beauty of the scenery off to your right. As you yeah. go down and see, you could be looking at the ocean and the mountains the entire time, but you miss it all because yeah. you're so focused on the destination. A big part of your fitness journey and improving your body composition and doing everything we've talked about in this podcast is recognizing all the stuff that happens to you along the way. It's not just about getting to the end yeah. result. So do not miss that along the way. And I think a reminder here to wrap this up at the end is that we were talking a lot about body composition, but in the end, I actually was reading an email from, from Cody this morning mm -hmm. that I really liked because it caught my attention because he used the word thrive. Mm -hmm. um, did you see that one? Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that, that is just like encompassing of what all this is about. Like we're trying to create a body that is thriving. Yeah. That is like, is, is in it for the long haul. This is the only body that we have and, and, and we have to treat it right. Yeah. And, and when we treat it right, we do get a certain look, mm -hmm. but it is all about the way that we're treating our body and the things that we want to do with our body yeah. as in the, in the years that come. And so, you know, if you're listening to this and it's just like, you're kind of like, I've wanted to do this. I think like the time is now, like there is no more, there's no better time to like make changes to your body composition that are going to make you a healthier person yeah. in the end yep. than now, because we don't, we don't know what's ahead. And yeah. like, we, we want to have a body that's capable mm -hmm. for as long as we can. Yeah. Doing, doing all this stuff, like it, it builds you, it builds you up to where you have a reserve to, for that rainy day. Yeah. Like if you have a low level of body fat and you have an above average amount of muscle and you have that athletic body composition, you have wiggle room to where if life happens or as you get older, you're still going to be strong. You're still going to be mm -hmm. leaner. You're not like on the edge of chronic disease to where yeah. if, if you 
get sick from something else or something bad happens to you physically that you're just going to fall into dependence on others or, or worse, yeah. you know, end up hospitalized. Like you have a reserve of fitness, of energy, of muscle to carry you over through those harder times. Mm -hmm. This was All good. Right. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, if you have any questions about this topic or you want us to help guide you through doing this on your own, you can apply for coaching mm -hmm. in the epi in the notes to this episode. All right. All right. Y'all have a good day.